1972, the United States paid $4 billion for oil imports. Th that was equal to about 4.5% of our defense budget for that year. In 1999, we paid $40 billion for oil imports. That was about 15% of our defense budget. In 2007, we paid $342 billion for oil imports. That was almost 70% of our defense budget of last year. And this year, the United States is going to import 5 billion barrels of oil at $130 a barrel. That comes out to $650 billion. So, which is 130% of our defense budget for this year. So it, it, it's five times the cost of the Iraq war. So not only are we, as many people have said, funding both sides in the war on terror, we've been doing that for a while, but now we're actually funding the other side more than we're funding our own side. It is important to understand who is to blame on this oil price rise. The media is very confused, you know. I mean, you know, the big oil, the oil companies, the gas station owners. No, it's, it's OPEC. And here's the proof. Now, if you look at non-OPEC oil production, what you see is that um, over this period, a third of a century, during which time the world economy has doubled in size, non-OPEC oil production has also doubled in size. Now look at OPEC oil production. Well, it's wild. It's up. It's down. It's all over the place in accord with arbitrary decisions of the cartel's leader to turn the taps on and off. Okay, so they are manipulating the market. But the other thing that's really truly remarkable is in 1973, they were 30 million barrels a day. And in 2007, they're 30 million barrels a day. That is over a third of a century, during which time the world economy has doubled in size. OPEC production has not increased at all, okay, despite the fact that they're sitting on top of 80% of the world's oil reserves, including all the easiest to drill stuff. Now, when you hear about the problem of our dependence on foreign oil, one of the things that comes up very quickly is the threat of another embargo, because people, or at least a lot of people, remember that. Remember 1973, 74, the gas lines, the factories shutting down, and all of that. Could that happen again? You bet it could happen again. Okay, but this time it would be a lot worse because in 1973 we were only 30% dependent on foreign oil. Now, as a result of a third of a century of complete fecklessness on the part of the political class in this country, far from fixing that problem, we are 60% dependent on foreign oil. But here's the real kicker. In 1973 the Arabs did not have much in the way of financial reserves. Oil had been selling for $2.50 a barrel up until the day of the embargo. They could not sustain it for more than a few months. Okay? Now they have trillions in financial reserves. Okay? They could sustain it a very long time. This is a disaster waiting to happen. We're up against a, it's like being up against a union with a trillion dollar strike fund. They're in position to shut this thing down as long as necessary. I mentioned we're paying $650 billion for foreign oil this year. We're going to pay another $400 billion for domestic oil. That's a trillion dollars Americans are going to pay for oil this year, up from $80 billion in 1999. A trillion dollars divided by 300 million Americans is $3,300 a person, man, woman, and child in this country, working or not or 13,000 bucks for a family of four. The average American worker makes $45,000 a year before taxes, maybe 35 after taxes. So here's a third of disposable income is actually going for oil. That's up from 3% in 1999. Is it any wonder that these people aren't buying houses? This is why I'm not that excited about the idea of drilling in, in Anwar in Alaska. It's not the answer here. We're importing 5 billion barrels of oil. There's only 16 billion barrels in Anwar, okay? so. This is a card we may have to play at some point, but it's a desperation play. It's one of the last strong cards in our hand. Okay? It's not the answer. It's not the way to win this game. Right now, from a practical point of view, in the large scale, there's only one way to power vehicles. That is cars, trucks, airplanes, even things like ships and trains that used to move by coal are now pretty much all driven by petroleum products. And this is what makes petroleum the Trump fuel. It's the thing that makes things move. So the question is, how do we change the Trump suit? That's the winning play here. Here's my one point program for accomplishing that. The United States Congress should pass a law requiring that all new cars sold in the United States be flex fueled. That that simply be the standard. They gotta have a steering wheel, they gotta have brakes.
if we had a standard that all new cars sold, not made, sold in this country, had to be flex fueled, within three years we'd have 50 million cars on the road in the United States capable of running on alternate fuels. And in that case, we would see ethanol pumps and methanol pumps at practically every corner gas station. And here's the real kicker, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Because if we made it the standard that to sell a car in the USA, it has to give the consumer fuel choice, all the foreign car makers would switch their lines over as well. The Japanese are not about to walk away from the American automobile market, neither the Koreans, the Germans, and the other Europeans, none of them. So they would switch their lines over. And what this would mean is that any car being marketed in any serious way anywhere in the world would be a flex fuel car. And gasoline would be forced to compete at the pump against both methanol and ethanol, made in any number of possible ways, not just in Iowa, but in Argentina, in India, in Kenya, in France, in Japan, Poland, India, everywhere, OK? And this is what would crash the price of oil to $50 a barrel. So what you saw in Brazil, they can't raise the price of gas if there is effective competition at the pump. This would create that globally. This is how we smash OPEC. You know, you see, the problem is with oil is that it is where it is. It's not something that you make. It's something that you take. The difference with the renewable fuels is they're things that you make. You don't acquire them through force, you acquire them through skill. Okay? And there can be peace because everybody can make their own. And that is the difference between the future of a world based on fixed resources and a world based on resources created through human skill and creativity and hard work. A world of peace or a world of war. See, because the thing you need to know about the oil business is this, is that while the oil business is a huge business, it involves a huge amount of money, it's not fundamentally about money. The bottom of the line, it's not. It's about power, power to rule, power to control the destiny of nations. Control of the world's fuel supply is control of the world's future. We cannot afford to leave this power in the hands of the enemies of freedom. In whose interest is it that the cars not be flex fueled? It's only in the interest of the oil cartel. It's only in the interest of America's enemies. Okay? Should their interests be allowed to prevail or should ours? This is the question that needs to be asked to every candidate running for office, in particular those running for president. Which side are they on? Okay? Will they support this mandate? <laughs> One thing you can do is contact your senators, especially those who are on the Commerce Committee, but all the senators, and ask them to become co-sponsors of this bill. There's a companion bill going to be introduced into the House by representatives of Kingston and Engel. Once again, get your congressman to co-sponsor the Open Fuel Standards Act. And if they won't, they got to explain why they don't want Americans to have fuel choice, okay? Why they want Hugo Chavez and the Saudis and the Iranians to keep taking money from us and the whole world. Why they want to keep enhancing the enemy's power at the expense of America and all of our friends. So that's the choice before them. Stick it to them. So this is the choice before us. There is two possible futures for humanity, one based on the petroleum economy, the other on the renewable fuel economy. A world of tyranny or a world of liberty. These are the choice. The stakes could not be higher. Okay? We've been given a trust. You know, The generation before us saved the world from people of this kind, okay? Uh, and now it's up to us. The weapons are different, okay? It's weapons of ideas, okay? We have to win, okay? It's not going to be easy, but we all have to engage. But you know, as, as Tom Paine said in an even earlier time of crisis, said, tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but the sun never shone on a nobler cause. Let's knock them flat. <laughs>